Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at section 5.5 dealing with calorimetry. It's our third set of notes dealing with thermochemistry from chapter 5. Now, since we cannot know the exact enthalpy of reactants and products, we measure delta H, changes in enthalpy through processes like calorimetry, the measurement of heat flow. You'll notice with our enthalpy diagrams that we've been looking at in previous notes, there's no axes numbers over here. So we don't really say where the enthalpy is at. It's just that it's increasing enthalpy. So we don't really know where this is or where that is on the enthalpy scale. What we do know and what we do look at is what that change in enthalpy is. Now, there's different apparatuses that we can use to measure heat flow. And if we're measuring heat flows in different reactions, we're going to use what's known as a calorimeter. Now, you can have really high-tech calorimeters like this one over here that's called a bomb calorimeter, which we're really not going to do any calculations with that. But in a higher-level college course, you would get into bomb calorimetry. What we deal with is a typical, simple coffee cup calorimeter over here. So the lab will be doing this chapter. We'll be using coffee cup calorimetry. You basically have a well-insulated device that you can have a reaction take place in. And you have a thermometer in there so you can track what's happening with changes in temperature. Now, we usually nest two styrofoam cups just to make a better insulated container and then put some type of topping on to, once again, help make sure that we don't have heat flow moving in and out of the system. It's not perfect, but for the type of calorimetry we're looking at, a simple coffee cup calorimeter works well to study heat flows. Now, the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a substance by 1K is known as the heat capacity. Now, changes in Kelvin, changes in degrees Celsius are the exact same. So you'll sometimes see them used interchangeably. Kelvin is not the same as Celsius, but changes in Kelvin are the exact same numerically as changes in degrees Celsius. So heat capacities really look at how much energy it takes to raise the temperature of a substance one degree Celsius. And remember, as you can see here on the thermometer scale, while Fahrenheit is different, changes in Celsius and changes in Kelvin are the exact same quantity. Now, molar heat capacity is, is a little bit more useful number than just plain heat capacity, because obviously the more you've got, the more energy it takes to warm up a swimming pool versus a cup of water. But when you're looking at molar heat capacity, we're level, leveling the playing field. It's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a substance, of one mole of a substance by 1K or 1 degree Celsius. And this would be a characteristic property of different substances. So different elements, different substances are going to have different molar heat capacities different specific heats, um, or molar heats, I should say. Specific heat is looking at the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of it, 1K. So really, the difference between molar heat and specific heat, molar, meat, molar heat is looking at raising one mole of a substance by one Kelvin. Specific heat is looking at raising one gram of it by one Kelvin. And remember, once again, changes in Kelvin <coughs> excuse me, are the same as changes in degrees Celsius. So sometimes for a specific heat unit here, you'll sometimes see it written as that, and it's used interchangeably. Well, that's because we're talking about changes in Kelvin here. Changes in degrees Celsius and changes in Kelvin are going to be the exact same quantity. Specific heat, then, is the heat transferred over the mass times the temperature change. You saw the unit was joules over gram degree Celsius or gram Kelvin. So that pretty much tells you what the equation is going to look like. Now, the symbol we use for specific heat is the symbol C. So you may remember this from last year, Q equals mc delta T, a common calorimetry equation. So the mass times the specific heat times the temperature change equals the heat flow. And remember, this can be a positive or negative value depending on when energy is going in or out. So make sure when you're calculating delta T here, like all deltas, it would be final minus initial. So the final temperature, not delta, it would be delta T equals temperature final minus temperature initial. And that establishes sine, whether it's positive or negative, whether energy is going into or out of the system. A couple of specific heat problems that you may be prepared for in notes. How much heat is needed to warm 250 grams of water, which is around one cup of water, from 22 degrees Celsius, which is around room temperature, to near its boiling point? 
Remember, water boils at 100, so 98, very close to its boiling point. Now, the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin, or degree Celsius. And you'll see this value a lot. It's not something you have to memorize, but you'll see it quite a bit, because most of the time when we're doing calorimetry stuff, we're looking at things that are happening or taking place in water. So we're measuring the energy of the system by measuring what's happening to the water. Now, the second thing we're going to look at is what would be the molar heat capacity. So we're going to look at how much heat is required to do this, and then we're going to calculate from that molar heat capacity. Now, remember, Q equals mc delta T. Now, delta T has to be final minus initial. Our final temp was 98. Our initial temp was 22. So we get a positive 76 degrees Celsius, which is the same as a positive 76 Kelvin. And it's positive because we had to put heat into the system. We warmed it up, so energy was going into the system, so it should be a positive value. So to calculate number one, first thing we need to do is get our delta T. Now the mass was given, we just have to have it in appropriate units, and we need our specific heat constant, which is given in the problem as joule per gram degree Celsius. So mass in grams is perfectly fine here for a specific heat. So the units here are gonna drive the units here and here. But remember, if it says degrees Celsius, don't let that throw you. Changes in Kelvin are the same as changes in degrees Celsius. So we multiply through and round to two sig figs. We end up with 7.9 times 10 to the fourth joules. Now, one thing you'll often see with problems is expressing not in joules, which is our SI unit, but in kilojoules. Well, that gives us a more convenient number. So 7.9 times 10 to the four, that's 79 and three zeros after it. So that would just be 79 kilojoules. So going back and forth between joules and kilojoules should be second nature, just like it is between grams and kilograms and milliliters and liters. That's a conversion you'll commonly have to do. So that's how much energy is involved in step one. Now, the next question uh, that you're supposed to answer is what is the molar heat capacity? Remember, that is the energy per mole. Well, we know how much energy was involved in doing this, and we know how many grams of water that is. So if we want to calculate the molar heat capacity in this particular problem, all we really need to do is take our constant because this is the specific heat. There's a connection between specific heat and molar heat. Specific heat is energy per gram. So if we change that to an energy per mole, which just involves the molar heat of the substance. Now, in this particular case, we're talking about water. So the, or I should say the molar mass. Since we're talking about water, the molar mass we'd be looking at here, so the gram amount would be 18.0 grams per mole. So we're trying to cancel grams, and grams are on the bottom, so that means mass would go on top, and then when grams cancel, we're left with joules per mole Kelvin. So if you want to go from specific heat to molar heat, all you really have to do is take your specific heat constant and convert grams into moles. By the same token, if you know what the molar heat was, you could calculate it back to the specific heat using the same conversion factor, just in a different way. So dimensional analysis, we use it all year in chemistry. Make sure that no matter what they're asking you to do, you can track units to see mathematically how you have to do that. Now, constant pressure calorimetry is what we're really doing in a uh, coffee cup calorimetry, because it's taking place, in essence, in room. I know it's got a cork top on it, but that cork top has holes in it, so the pressure is going to be constant throughout the course of this reaction. So by carrying out a reaction in an aqueous solution in a simple calorimeter called a coffee cup calorimeter such as this one, you can indirectly measure the heat change of the system by measuring the heat change in the water. And that's why that 4.184 is going to pop up again and again and again because most of the times we're looking at solution reactions. Those are reactions that are taking place in water. Water is the medium that is going to heat up or cool off based upon what's happening with the energy in the reaction itself. So because the reaction takes place in a solution, the pressure will be constant and delta H can be measured directly as the same thing as Q. So remember we established this before in previous notes when we're dealing with a constant pressure situation like in this room, delta H is the same as Q. Now because the specific heat for water is well known, the 4.184 we saw before, we can measure delta H for the reaction with our Q equals MC delta T equation. Now in a calorimeter, the water is part of the surrounding. So one of the things you have to remember is if we want to calculate the Q of the solution, it's the negative of the Q of the reaction. So when we plug in our values, the mass of the solution times the specific heat of the solution 
times the temperature change of the solution. What we're actually calculating is the Q of the solution. If we want to look at what's happening with the reaction, what the water is gaining, the so the uh, what the you know, what the solution is gaining, the reaction is losing, and consequently. So remember, the Q that we're going to calculate is the opposite of the Q that we're really looking at. Now, for water solutions, the specific key of the solution is assumed to be the same as water 4.184. That's not a perfect assumption, but it's very, 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 very close to the exact same. So you'll notice in problems, they'll typically say something like, assume the specific key of the solution is the same as the specific key to water. That's all it says is you're going to be using 4.184 a lot. Now, when a student mixes 50.0 milliliters of 1.0 molar HCl and 50 milliliters of 1.0 molar NaOH in a coffee cup calorimeter, the temperature of the resultant solution increases from 21.0 to 27.5 degrees Celsius. Calculate the enthalpy, enthalpy change for the reaction in kilojoules per mole of HCl. It's always really important. What do they want us to calculate the energy in the form of? In this case, they're looking at kilojoules per mole, and they're looking at it from the perspective of HCl. It's another important idea. Assuming the calorimeter loses only a negligible quantity of heat, in other words, we're going to ignore any energy changes that are because we're using a really simple coffee cup calorimeter, the total volume of the solution is going to be 100.0 milliliters. It also specifies that the density of water is 1.0 grams per milliliter, and we're going to assume that these are low concentration water solutions, so the density of the solutions are the same as the density of water, and that the specific heat of the solution is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So they've thrown a lot at us here. Well, first of all, we've got a reaction between HCl and NaOH. Typical acid-base reaction right out of last chapter, so you know your products are going to be salt and water. So start with looking at what's happening in our reaction. Now, we know that the Q is going to equal the M times the C times the delta T of the solution. And what we really want to know is the Q of the reaction, so it's going to be the opposite of that. So start pulling numbers out that are relevant for what we're looking at here. We've got 100.0 milliliters, and we've got a density of 1.0 gram per milliliter. Well, M is mass, so we need to find the mass. And by using the volume of the density in this particular case, we can find out what the mass of the solution is. So remember, our equation is the clue for what we're going to need to do here. So the very first thing we looked at was, well, I need M, so how do I get M? We'll take a look at what's given. We know the total volume is 100.0 milliliters, and they tell us the density of that solution is 1.0 grams per milliliter. Next, we need a C. Well, they give us the C is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And finally, we need delta T. So that's another thing that we're going to have to calculate here. We went from 21.0 to 27.5, final minus initial. The change would be 6.5 Kelvin. So when we plug into our equation, we would take the mass times the specific heat times the temperature change, multiply those quantities together, and notice that little negative there, because we're looking at the Q of the reaction. And this calculation right here is the Q of the solution. So we'd have to multiply it by negative 1. So the Q of the reaction is negative 2.7 kilojoules. That's how much energy is released by the equation, or I should say by the reaction when it occurs. So for these specific quantities, 2.7 kilojoules of energy is being released. That's why it's a negative. Now remember, if you know a volume and a molarity, whenever you see those two things, that often means you're going to be calculating the number of moles. Well, the question that it was asking us to find here was what was the heat of the reaction in kilojoules per mole of HCl? Well, in this reaction, we had 0 0.050 moles of HCl reacting. And remember, we used that using our volume concentration relationship that we used and exploited a lot last chapter. So from the viewpoint of HCl, we had 0 0.050 moles. Well, when 0 0.050 moles of HCl reacted, we got this much energy in kilojoules. So if we want to find out the kilojoule per mole, take your kilojoules and divide by your number of moles. So negative 2.7 over 0 0.050 moles, it's negative 54 kilojoules per mole. And that ends our set of notes for today.